In this video, we're going to look at the basic concepts of probability and some basic concepts of counting. We're going to start off with some vocabulary. Um, when we talk about a probability experiment, it is some sort of action, trial, uh, which specific outcomes, uh, whether they are counts or measurements uh, or responses, are obtained. So in a probability experiment, we could be rolling a die, we could be picking somebody at random from a population, and <clears throat> what we're looking to do is to look at the possible outcomes and the likelihood of certain outcomes. Speaking of the word outcome, that's our next word. Uh, the, the outcome is the result of a trial that we do, right? So a single trial that we do for a probability experiment, whatever the outcome is, we define it as the outcome. Uh, and the sample space, if we were to take all the possible outcomes, kind of list them and put them into a set, uh, that would, that set of outcomes is called my sample space. And this is where we look at what is possible. So we're looking at all the possible outcomes. Now, some of those outcomes we may deem desirable and those we will call our event. So it's one or more of the outcomes and is a subset, so a smaller set of the overall sample space, all the possible results of our probability experiment. So let's say we are going to ask people a couple of questions. First thing we're going to ask is their blood type. Was it O, A, B, or A, B? the four different blood types, and whether they are RH positive or RH negative. So what we want to do is determine how many outcomes are possible and then what would be our sample space. One of the things that we could do to sort of systematically figure this out is to look at what we call a probability tree. And in a probability tree, we draw out each part will have a certain outcome. The first one has to do with the outcomes of their blood type. So we had O, we had A, we had B, and then we had AB. The four different types of uh, blood. And then from these, we had either a positive RH or a negative uh, RH. And so each one of these had two possible things with it. Each person would have one of the two blood types and then they would either be positive or negative in terms of uh, their RH. <clears throat> so listing these out, we can see by looking at the end that there are eight outcomes possible. We could have O plus or O negative. We could have A plus or A negative. We could have B plus or B negative. And we can have AB plus uh, or a b negative all right so these are the all the possible outcomes if i put them into a set these would be my sample space sample space in this case for this particular probability experiment is contained within those braces so that is our tree example there um, there's lots of other examples we could give. We talk about a simple event. A simple event is an event that consists of a outcome. So, for example, tossing a heads and rolling a three. So here we are, if we're doing a diagram for this, we are tossing a coin and then rolling a die. So we can start off with the coin. Say, okay, well, it's either going to be a heads or a tails. Pretty simple. Two possible outcomes. But then we roll a die in combination with that. We can see that there are six outcomes, uh, and we associate, associate those six outcomes either with the heads or we associate it with the tail. And so we get our list of possible outcomes. We can see here that there are 12 different possible outcomes, uh, heads one through six or tails one, uh, one through six. Each one of those would be a single outcome. Heads one means I got a heads and a one, so that's a single outcome. Uh, so tossing a heads, rolling a three, H3, that would be uh, a single outcome. 
But if we have an event that consists of more than one outcome, that is not a simple event. Uh, so tossing heads and then rolling something even. Okay, well, there's three outcomes for that event. Uh, so it's not a simple event, but it is an event. Uh, H2, H4, and H6 would all be successful outcomes for that event. So uh, if we determine the number of outcomes of each event, then decide whether each event is simple or not, explain your reasoning. Okay, well, for quality control, you randomly select a machine part from a batch that has been manufactured that day. Event A is selecting a specific dice, but sorry, selecting a specific defective machine part. If I select a defective machine part, that is one uh, outcome. And so this would be a simple experiment. Simple event, sorry. There's only one possible outcome, and that outcome is I get a defective machine part. Okay, number of outcomes for each event, then decide which ev event is simple or not. All right, so we roll a six-sided die. Event B is rolling at least a four. So if I look at my sample space here, I'm either going to get a, uh, a one, a two, a three, four, five, or six. Those are all the possible outcomes. For my event B, rolling at least a four would consist of four, five, or six. At least uh, includes that outcome and then everything greater than that outcome. So at least a four would include four, five, and six. So this is not a simple event. There are more than one possible ways to succeed. This kind of brings us to what we would call the fundamental counting principle. You may have noticed a pattern on what we were doing previously, uh, but here's what the fundamental counting rules principle says. Um, if one event can occur in M different ways and a second avert, uh, event, sorry, can occur in N ways, the number of ways two events can occur in sequence is M times N. This can be extended for any number of events occurring in a sequence. So for example, when we were doing the heads or tails and then rolling a dice uh, for the heads or tails, the coin, there were two possible outcomes, heads or tails. And then for the dice that we were casting, there were six different outcomes, one through six. And so you, as if you remember, there were 12 different outcomes at the very end there. If I toss a coin, roll a die, 12 outcomes possible. What the fundamental counting principle allows us to do is determine the number of outcomes for any given probability trial or experiment. Not every one, but a lot of them. And really the number is the important part. We need to get a count of how many outcomes are possible many times in a probability experiment or trial. <clears throat> so for example, if we have three different manufacturers for GM and Honda, we have two different types, compact or midsize, and then four different colors, we can use the fundamental counting principle to figure out how many possible outcomes there are. Uh, we have three different manufacturers, two different car sizes, and then four different colors. Uh, three times two times four gives us 24. There are 24 different possible combinations of manufacturer car size and color. We can see that in uh, this tree. Again, uh, same idea. We have three different manufacturers, the two different types, and then the four different colors. And if we count all these, there are six, one, two, three, four, five, six different groups of four, so that's a total of 24. Let's look at some other examples using the fundamental counting principle. Uh, let's say we have, we want to find how many different access codes are possible. 
The access codes for a call sh car security system consists of four digits. Each digit can be any number from zero to nine. So four different digits, kind of like our pin, no, typical pin numbers are usually four digits as well. So the question is how many access codes are possible when each digit can only be used once and cannot be repeated? So for number one, there's four different spots, remember, but we cannot repeat any of the digits. So for the first spot, uh, we would have 10 different possible digits, zero through nine, there are 10 digits there. But then once I've used a digit, there's one fewer, so there's nine on the second, eight on the third, and then seven on the fourth. Multiplying these out, we get 5,040 different possible codes using those rules. The second rule says, uh, how many codes are possible when each digit can be repeated? So if we can have repeating uh, digits, that gives me 10, 10, 10, and 10, or 10 to the fourth power uh, to shorten that up, which is one with four zeros. That gives us 10,000 different possible combinations there. And then number three says each digit can be repeated, but the first digit cannot be a zero or a one. All right, so our first digit is restricted. Um, since it can't be zero and it can't be a one, that only leaves me with eight different possibilities. But each digit can be repeated after that. And there's 10 different possibilities. This was only for the first digit of the number. So the rest of these can be 10. So this gives me eight times 10 to the third. 10 to the third is 1,000, so that's eight times 1,000 or 8,000 different combinations, uh, eight different, 8,000 different access codes. Now let's look at some types of probability. We have three basic types of probability. The first one being sort of the classical theoretical probability. This is the one that we use uh, a lot and we will be using a lot of in this book. And it really comes down to one fundamental theorem. And <clears throat> when each outcome in a sample space is equally likely, this is an important part of this. Um, <clears throat> we have to have equally likely out outcomes for each item in my sample space. But when that's the case, the probability of an event, at which we will represent here with E, but you could put anything in there. For example, you could put probability of tails, right? For flipping a coin, depending on the, the thing. So this is our probability notation here. Really helps you, uh, and you wanna start practicing using this as you're writing out your probabilities. we will say the probability of any event E is equal to the number of outcomes uh, in event E. So we look at our sample space and we say which ones meet this description and we count them. So we have the number of outcomes that comprise event E divided by the total number of outcomes in my sample space. Of course, remember sample space by definition is every possible outcome for a given probability trial or experiment. So uh, this theorem applies when every outcome is likely within a sample space. Let's say we roll a single-sided die. We know that that is a fair die, we, or we assume as such. Find the probability of each event. So first event being uh, that we roll a three, second event that we roll a seven, and then third event, rolling a number less than five. So for the first event, uh, event A, probability of rolling a three. We can look at event A, and this of course down here is my sample space. I'm just gonna go ahead and put that in sets. So we think of the sample space as a, as a collection of outcomes. So uh, set notation is what we're using there. Uh, event A then, we can put also as a set. It is a subset of the larger set. And event A rolling a three would consist of the three part of that. So the probability then 
of event A, which is defined as rolling a three, is equal to there is one three out of the six possible outcomes that are in my sample space. Event B, uh, rolling a seven, we can see that for event B, there is nothing in my sample space. This is the empty set. Uh, so the probability of B, I don't know why I wrote S there. Let's undo that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> probability of event B is going to be equal to there are zero. Remember, this is the count of the number of items in my sample space out of the six that are there. So the probability of this happening is a zero. If I roll a single die, uh, it's impossible for me to roll a seven because as we can see, a seven does not exist uh, in the sample space. Event C, rolling a number less than five. So here we can see that this would include dice numbers one, two, three, and four. Um, less than five would not include five. So the probability of C is the count of my event space, which is four, all the numbers less than five out of six or two thirds, which would be 0.667 if we round that. <clears throat> the next type of probability is empirical probability. When we talk about empirical, we're talking about the results of something, right? It's the proof, the undeniable, here is what we got. So empirical probability is simply based on observations that we obtain from probability experiments. So not knowing them ahead of time, not taking them into theoretical areas, uh, we're simply saying, let's just do an experiment and see what happens and base the probability on that. And we're looking at the percent of successes that we get when we perform the trial. Uh, so probability of any event would be the frequency of the outcomes that we're looking for. So the frequency of our event, how many times did we succeed, divided by how many times we actually performed the event. So the total frequency of the trials. Notice that N is usually the size of our sample, right? Uh, but it would be the sum of all of the frequencies. So everything that occurred. There are some questions that we ask or uh, things we want to know about a population, a very large population, that actually can only be determined by empirical probability, right? If we want to know what the... Uh, opinion is of a given topic, we need to ask the population that topic. And we're going to base our estimated probability uh, or what the percent of the population feels about it based on the sample that we take. So uh, let's look at some scenarios. Here's a just a you know, random scenario. A company is conducting an online survey of randomly selected U.S. adults to determine how they read books during the past year, if at all. So far, 1,490 adults have been surveyed. The pie chart shows the results. Note that the digital books include ebooks as well as audiobooks. What is the probability that the next adult surveyed read only print books during the last year? Right, so here's the eventual probability question that we ask, right? If we're asking what the probability is, that uh, the next person we talk to would read only print books during the last year, we want to look at what our sample is saying about the population, our sample of 1,040 people. Um, and we're going to base our probability on that, right? So we, we look at a population's characteristics, and then we can turn that relative frequency into the probability for the next person that I survey. And we want to find the probability of uh, print only. So I'm just going to put that in there, print only. So we need to look at uh, how many read just print books. And that looks like the blue here 
is our print books. We have print books, then read only digital, read both print and digital, and read no books at all. But we see that the highest number here, 578, read print only books. And then we know that the total, which we could confirm by adding these up, but we were told in the problem, was there were 1,490 people in the survey. And so this translates into probability. If I look at the relative frequency, uh, which we can easily find 578 divided by 1490, that gives me approximately 0 0.388 or 38.8% would be the probability that the next person I select, almost 40%, the probability would read print books only. If a company is conducting a phone survey of randomly selected individuals to determine the ages of social networking site users, so far 975 social networking site users have been surveyed and the frequency distribution shows our results. Rewording this now as a probability, what is the probability that the next user surveyed is 23 to 35 years old. So in my frequency table here, we had the number of people who used social networking sites. And we have the category that is 23 to 35. There were 312 people. So probability that the next one would be 23 to 35 would be equal to uh, that number, 312, which, again, I believe is the largest number there, divided by the sum of my frequencies, which was 975. Calculating that approximate percentage out, we know it's about a third, close to a third. 312 divided by 975 actually comes out to be exactly 0.32. In fact, I'm going to make this equals or 32% probability that a person would be between 23 and 35 years old. Now, how accurate do you think this is to real life? Like, what is, uh, what are we basing this on? You'll notice that I'm only basing it on a, you know, sample of 975 people, so a little under 1,000 people. And so this... That could be very, you know, depending on how well I did my sample, this could be fairly representative. And so it also needs to be, again, conducted quite well. It's not all just about how many people fell into that group, like what the count is as in terms of how reliable it is, but it's also about how that information was collected, whether it was collected in the right way. Um, <clears throat> but as you can imagine, Assuming that we're collecting it fairly randomly, the larger my total frequency gets, the better or more accurate my results will be. Uh, for example, if they were conducted in the same way, assuming that they're both conducted fairly well, uh, this would the 32% would be more accurate than a sample of 200 people, right? So the more people we get into our sample, the better it tends to be, or the more accurate my numbers tend to be in terms of estimating the probability or the percentage of the population. Which takes us to our next idea here, which is the law of large numbers. As an experiment is repeated over and over, the empirical probability of an event approaches the theoretical, or the actual probability, of the event. We can actually see this in uh, real-world situations uh, and computer simulations, especially uh, since, for example, let's take just the very basic idea of t uh, the probability of getting we ahead uh, when we toss a coin. And we know that the probability of that is 50%, right? Kind of like what we know the uh, probability of rolling any one number when we roll a dice is is one six about point one six seven right so if we base it on our actual counts if we if we sat there and flipped a coin 
or to computer simulations, we see at the small number that we've done <clears throat> that our probabilities can can range pretty wide widely. Um, at the very beginning, we may have you know something that approaches eighty percent probability, like a seventy five percent probability. Let's say three out of four tosses that we we do. So we do four tosses, uh, and so our count is four, and we um, we get three out of four. So that gives me about a seventy five percent. So that's where this would pull, right? Three out of four of my tosses so far have been heads. So we say, oh, there's a seventy five percent probability of this happening. Then maybe it goes to something below seventy, and then at any rate, maybe we get a lot of tails in a row, and now we're down to like thirty percent. But what happens eventually is as the number of tosses increases, we get closer and closer to the real probability of that particular experiment, which in our case is 50%. That also goes with the sample sizes that we have, right? That idea of larger is better, bigger is better, all things being equal, we can say that larger samples are more accurate than smaller samples, though it also depends on uh, how well we polled for those samples. The last type of probability is called subjective probability. Um, this is where we're using intuition, educated guesses, and just estimates. So a doctor may feel a patient has a 90% chance of full recovery. Maybe that's based in his evaluation of your health versus the, uh, you know, sort of survival rate of certain diseases and how you compare with other patients in terms of your overall health. Another example would be the weather reports that we look at, right? Weather reports are giving us and are really based in the expertise of the guesser, right? And we say guess because it kind of is a guess. Economic forecasts and political forecasts are all very similar in that way. Uh, nobody quite knows, but we feel like the more that they know about the subject, the more reliable their prediction might be. So let's look at some other possible examples. Um, let's say the probability you'll get an A on your next test is 90%, and let's just say that that's what your teacher is predicting. And maybe this is based on this, the homework that they see you doing, the results of previous exams, and just uh, feedback that they're seeing from you in the class when questions are being asked. Regardless, this would be an example, again, of uh, subjective probability here. Um, we're subjecting it to the expertise of your teacher, or maybe it's for yourself, your past experience. Whoever's making that guess, this is definitely a subjective probability. All right, how about the probability of voter chosen at random will be younger than 35, old, uh, 35 years old, is 30%. Okay, well, this would most likely be based on uh, past data that they've collected about voters and the age brackets of those voters. And so this would be an example of empirical probability. Most likely it's based on real numbers that have been collected and not just somebody's ex experience. The probability of winning a 1,000 ticket Raffle with one ticket is one out of 1,000. Okay, well, this is just straight up classical probability. There are 1,000 tickets to choose from, so the probability of your ticket being the winner is just going to be one out of 1,000. Classical probability. Uh, sample space would be the 1,000 tickets, and the event that you win would be that one event, that one ticket that you purchased winning so looking at probability, you've noticed a few things, uh, hopefully, that you've seen. Is every time we find a probability, we never get something that's above one. That's one of the first things that you may notice. Uh, and if you think about classical probability and uh, the formula that we were using, the sample space is every possible outcome, right? We have the count of our sample space, so the number of items in my event space, divided by the number of items in my sample space. And we can never have our event space as a subset of the sample space. So the highest we could have is that, for example, we roll a die, we get a number one through six. 
Well, that would be six out of six, which is one. That's a 100% chance of success that you will either get some, a one, a two, three, four, five, or six. And so one is the highest uh, probability you are certain, it is certain to occur. And if there's nothing in my sample space uh, that, that fits the description of the event, then that would be an impossible outcome. So my probabilities can only be somewhere between and including zero and one. And so that's what we see here as uh, a set out rule. We cannot have probability be more than one. So in terms of more complicated formulas, if you ever end up working through these really complicated formulas and get something that's like 101.25, that would be an impossible probability something went wrong in your calculations. One other very important idea is the idea of complementary events, uh, the complement. A complement, if we picture our uh, sample space as our box here, so we have this rectangular, this represents all the possible outcomes um, for a trial or experiment. And then my event is a subspit, subset of that, so we'll just put a circle in here. That's my event E. <clears throat> if we want to look at the events that are outside of E, which would be outside of the circle here, we call those our E prime, or sometimes you just say not E. Uh, so we denote that as E prime. We say the probability of my event occurring or uh, the probability of it not occurring is 100% or one. And so we can use this idea of complementary events to actually help us find the probability of an event. Sometimes it's either, it's easier for us to count up the ways something can't occur uh, than it is to, to directly try to count the number of ways it can occur. So the probability of any event is gonna be one minus the probability it does not happen. Or vice versa, you can say the probability of the complement is one minus probability of the event. At either way, uh, the number of items in my complement space plus the number of items in my event space is equal or should be equal to the number of items in my sample space. We looked at before the probability of randomly selecting a social networking site. We looked at the people who are 25 to 35 years old. We saw uh, that was 312 out of the 975. So if we're asked the probability of selecting someone who is not in the 25 to 35 year old age bracket, uh, this is going to be equal to one. Uh, so the probability, we'll call this event E, this would be my not E, right, is going to be one minus the probability of E. This was equal to 1 minus the probability of E, if you remember, was 312 out of 975, which was exactly 0.32. So I know that the probability of uh, anyone selecting somebody who's not in the 25, 23 to 35 age bracket is going to be almost 70%, 68%. A probability experiment consists of tossing a coin and spinning the spinner. The spinner is equally likely to land on each number. Use a tree diagram to find the probability of each event. So event A, we're going to toss a tail, and then we're going to spin an odd number, and then event B, tossing a head or spinning a number greater than three. Okay, well, we could draw this out, and I'm going to at least start the process here. We'll start off with the... the you know, the tossing of the coin, either that's going to be a heads or a tails. So put tails and heads. And then with the spinner, uh, there's eight different outcomes. So I need eight different legs here. And we would put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight as the choices. And we would do the same thing over here. Um, let's look at a summarized version of this. Aha, yay, they did it for us. Um, so again, heads and tails, 
and then all the possible outcomes. So for event A, the event A, if you recall, let's go back, it's tossing a tail and then spinning an odd number. So tails and then odd numbers, one, three, five, and seven. And we see there are four ways that this can happen. Remember also the fundamental counting principle. This was two, uh, and then this was eight. If we multiply that, we have the total number of possible outcomes here, which if we count them is 16, two times eight. So event A uh, would consist of T1, tails and uh, spinning and getting a one, uh, T3, T5, and T7. We can see this is not a simple event. Uh, there are more than one outcomes. And so we can see that the probability of this event A is equal to four out of 16, or one fourth, which is 0.25, which is 25%. All of these are acceptable ways of expressing the probability here. Event B was, was worded very differently. Uh, event B asked, uh, tossing a head, or spinning an odd, oops, I don't think that's right. Odd number was the last one. This would be spinning a number greater than three. So notice on the last one, it actually said and uh, it was, and I'm going to go back and pull this up, tossing a tail and spinning an odd number. So both of these had to occur. The word or, though, is different. Uh, or suggests that we have optional ways of being successful. And so there's two ways here that are laid out for me. I'm going to be successful if I toss a head. Right? Tossing a head is one thing that I can do uh, to be successful. So this is one option that I have. The second option is spinning a number greater than three. If this had had an and, I would need for both of these to occur. But with or, or suggests that as long as either this happens or this happens or they both happen, we're good. So with tossing a head as being a good outcome, then once I've done that, it doesn't matter which uh, number I get when I spin, if it's greater than three or not greater than three, it doesn't matter because I tossed a head. If I toss a tail, so I, I didn't quite make this event happen, then I have a second way of being successful, and that's by spinning a number that is greater than three. And so that gives me four, five, six, seven, and eight with a tails being an okay outcome. So here we can see uh, that the probability of B has many different outcomes there. We could even find this as one minus the probability that B doesn't occur, right? That I'm unsuccessful. Why? Because there's only three of those and there's fewer. So I can go one minus three out of 16, which will give me 13 out of 16. Decimal wise, 13 out of 16. is about 0.8125 or about 81.3% chance of that occurring. And you, we could have counted this directly. We had 8, and then we had 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, right? But I wanted to use this just as another way uh, to look at the complement rule as a way for us to save time. Your college ID number consists of eight digits. Each digit can be zero through nine and each digit can be repeated. What is the probability of getting your college ID number when randomly generating eight digits? All right, so if we have eight digits and each one of these uh, can be 10 different numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, then, and we can repeat them. So it doesn't sound like there's many rules besides 
uh, that. There's nothing saying that can't be repeated. This is going to be 10 to the 8th power, which is a 1 with 8 zeros following it. So that would be 100 uh, million different possible numbers. 100 million different possible outcomes. So what is the probability of your college ID number would be generated, would be uh, the probability of that event would be one out of 100 million. Decimal wise, that's uh, nine zeros. and a one. And I meant seven zeros. I may have said 10, I'm not, I'm not sure what I said, but uh, at any rate, seven zeros with a one. So obviously an extremely low probability, we could even put this in as percent form with one, two, three, four, five, six. So five zeros with a one uh, and put the percentage symbol there. Otherwise I just kicked out two of those. But that would be uh, using the fundamental counting principle to come up with a quick probability, counting out how many different combinations are possible, and then knowing that my particular one that I picked out was one of those 100 million different possibilities.